Amen. It's a dangerous thing because the clock that I normally look at in the back, that screen is broken today. And so we are in a timeless worship experience. <laughs> Nobody, we're, this is a, a timeless worship experience. We may be here for eternity, but <laughs> no, we be that long. Stand with me to your feet, and uh, I want to read something to you. Um, you know, we, we have church talk, church speak, just like there's jargon for different um, professions. There's jargon that's only spoken between medical professionals. There's jargon that's only spoken between legal professionals. There's jargon that's only spoken between financial um, professionals. But we have something that's called church jargon. But the word that we're going to talk about today is more than just church jargon. How many of you have ever heard the word anointing? Everybody's anointed. We're, we're, we're anointed. And, and uh, amen. Let's just get into it. <laughs> We're just going to let the Word do what the Word does. Now, let, let me give you some background. Um, there was a young woman whose name was Hannah who was barren. We're following the story now. She couldn't have any children. And she went to uh, the, the, the temple one day to pray, and her heart was so broken, she was praying under her spirit. She was mumbling, and, and the high priest thought that she was drunk, but she wasn't. Uh, she was in bitterness of heart because she was barren and she didn't have any children. And uh, the priest told her, he said, next year this time, about the time of life, you're going to have a son. And um, she did have a son, but she made a promise. She made a vow to God. She said, if, if you will allow me to have this child, I will dedicate this child to you for all the days of his life. Can you imagine a mother's pain after weaning a child, but then my promise to God has to be greater than the love that I have for my child. And she took that young boy back. His name was Samuel. And, uh, and now Samuel has grown up into the things of God, and he is a mighty prophet. And he's about to encounter a young man whose name is Saul, who's off on a journey looking for some lost livestock. But <laughs> I want you to hear what I'm saying. You can be looking for livestock, and yet God has an anointing for you that's called a kingly anointing. You see, sometimes we're chasing things and looking for things that God really has no interest in. And you can have an encounter with a man or a woman of God that can speak a word. I'm a living witness. That can speak one word into your life and radically change your life. So they were looking for these donkeys, and now they've become uh, exhausted they are frustrated, and they don't know what to do, and they're going back to talk to this prophet, and he's going to tell this young man who left home doing one thing, he's about to give him a word that's going to turn his life completely around. So let's go ahead and begin reading in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to start at 15, and we're going to read straight through. All right, you all ready? Are you really ready? All right, I like that. Ready. All right, let's go. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his dear ear a day before Saul came, saying, I don't want to run over that. The Lord told Samuel in his ear. The Lord will tell you everything you need to know before they tell you. Yes. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over all the people of Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. Let's pause there for a moment while they switch that to the NIV. If you look at that verse very carefully, you will see that you're not anointed for you. God anoints you because he's looking at a bigger picture. And if everything has to be about you, you better question the anointing that you say that you have. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel, and he will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will... Next verse. Next verse. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where, is the seer, where the seer's house is? 
I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will show you on your way and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They've been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Saul answered, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such things to me? Go ahead and let's do this. Let's drop down to number 10. Drop down to chapter number 10. Hallelujah. That was a mistake on my part. Beginning at verse number 10, I need you to follow this narrative very carefully. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelzah on the border of Benjamin. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look for have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them and is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my sons? Next verse. They will greet you and offer you two loaves of bread, which you will accept from them. After that, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town, you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres and timbrels and pipes and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be... Say that again. You'll be what? Changed into a different person. Next verse. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel... <laughs> Read that again. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. How many of you know that God can change a person's heart? And all these signs were fulfilled that day. Next verse. When he and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. Next verse, please. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked each other, what is this that has happened to the son of Kish? I'm here to tell you. <laughs> when the Lord puts his hands on you, folk that knew you before you got saved are going to scratch their head, wait a minute. That's cut. I know what cut used to do. You mean to tell me cut is preaching? But anyway, all right, that's good. <laughs> a man who lived there. And, okay, that, that, that's good. All right, y'all may, may sit down. I just want to talk to you about that. This young man comes out, and uh, he needs a word from the Lord. And uh, How many of you know that we're living in the last days? We are living in perilous times. As a matter of fact, when you say that we're living in the last days, that means that we are living in the last, the very last of all generations before the coming of Jesus Christ. And, and the Bible clearly says that, that in these last days, you're going to see some strange things happen, not only outside of the body of Christ, but you're going to see some crazy stuff happen on the inside of the church. Do y'all ever watch social media? When did we start kicking Bibles? When did we start pouring syrup on the Bible? When did we start? Y'all don't, don't know. When did we start dancing so much on New Year's Eve you couldn't tell whether or not you were in a church or you were in a nightclub? When, when did all of this weird, crazy stuff start happening in the church? When did we start charging people $1,500 just to teach them how to pray? Where did all this foolishness come from? You know, and here's the thing. With all of these apostles that we have, we have more apostles now in the body of Christ than ever before. When are they going to step into the office of apostle and begin to correct all of these errors that we see in the church? 
It's happening, and, and nobody is correcting anybody. We're simply carrying a title, and we just, we don't want to stir up any trouble. You know, we don't want to sow any discord. If the anointing of an apostle is on your life, you're going to sow some discord, and you're going to stir up some trouble because that's what apostles do. The Bible says that in these last days, it's going to get so crazy. How many of you just watch the news? You're seeing stuff on the news. And like, what in the world is going on? When you get to a point where you see a man dressed up as a woman in a pulpit, and they're not the pastor, but they are the first gentleman. And you sit here and shake your head like you don't see what's going on. But I'm telling you, there is some strange kind of stuff that's going on in the church. And here's the catcher. Paul knew this was going to happen. He said it's going to get so bad and people will not want to be corrected. They're going to want to do church the way that they do church. They're going to want to worship God the way that they want to worship God. And it's going to become so bad that they would rather call in somebody to tell them stories and fables. Let me show you. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse, verse 1 through 5. You don't care if their doctrine is off, if they make you feel good. You don't care if what they're saying is in line with the Bible as long as they take that mic and... <laughs> I'm going to tell you now, that's nothing but foolishness and the Holy Ghost will have nothing with that. You don't have to scream to get God's attention. You already have God's ear. So you don't have to scream and act a fool to get it. I know I'm canceled. That's okay. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 4. Can we put it up there on the screen? I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Uh, quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. I'm sorry. Preach the word, not stories, not fairy tales. Not fables, not nice little neat anecdotes that make you feel good, but preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. You rebuke somebody now and you reprove somebody now, they're liable to cuss you out before they leave the church because there is no submission any longer in the body of Christ. Have you ever looked at the word submission? Sub means to be below. If I'm in submission, I'm below the mission. I'm not above the mission. But you have people now that won't submit to the vision of a ministry. They want to be above it. All right, let's keep going. Amen. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust will pay twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 to have speakers come in. And uh, let me get that quote saying. Their own lust and shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Rather than hearing what the Word of God has to say, tell me a story. Make me feel good. Make me shout. Never challenge me. Never correct me. Let me do whatever I want to do. Let me sleep with all the women in the church and don't you ever say anything to me. Let me be a church skeezer and go to church and just run around and never say anything to me. Let, you know, because nobody, nobody wants to be challenged anymore. And if the truth be known, a lot of churches don't want a pastor. They want a puppet. They want someone that they can control with their giving, someone that they can control with their influence. But a real man and woman of God, I don't care how much money you give to that person or you give to the church, if you do wrong, he'll tell you, keep your money because what you're doing is not right. And I'm sorry. Amen. Don't ever take this job if you want to be friendly to everybody. Don't ever try to come up and do this job if you're a people pleaser. Don't ever try to come up and do this job if you can't stand for anybody to talk about you or say some stuff about you or lie. This is not the job for you. You need to go work somewhere else. All right, now, one of the things you're also going to see in the last days, because we're living in the last days, is you're going to see counterfeit anointings. That's the devil's specialty. The devil produces counterfeit anointings. And if you don't know the difference between the real and the fake, the fake will pass for real every time. You don't have to be anointed to preach. There are actors in Hollywood that can put on a suit and come up here and can preach much better than I can. There are singers that are actors that can come up here and sing y'all happy all the time, but no anointing anywhere. 
denying the power of God and whatnot. And so how can I tell the difference? Let me show you something. You see, the devil is a counterfeiter. How many of y'all have ever heard me say this? He invented counterfeiting, you see. Now, I don't have time to get the scripture, but let me show you something else. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 3. Just because you go to a church and they have master prophet so-and-so and so is going to be in town. Who told you God is with any of that? How do you know? Have you ever gone into a church and something didn't feel right? <laughs> Ooh, Lordy, I wish Eric was here. He's, uh, he's pastoring a church in Boston. We, uh, I was preaching one time out in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and a pastor had a, he, he saw me on television while I was teaching a class at a university, and he asked me to come out there and preach, and we went out there, and, and even before I got on the plane, it didn't feel right, but I went ahead anyway. And uh, we got out there, man, in Louisiana, they have some of the best gumbo ever. They feed you good before you preach. And, uh, and I was up there, and I was trying to do my best to preach, but something weird had happened in this church. I didn't know the history at the time. But there were a bunch of people that were upset and mad with the present pastor. And I found out later that when the pastor had died, rather than his son taking over the church, he had appointed someone else to take over the church. And uh, his son still went there, but the people, they were really, really salty. And I forget what I said to call out what was happening in that church. All I know is more than half of that church was up at the altar because of the foolishness that was going on. I went to another church over in Ocala. This is some years ago. And in the middle of my preaching, the Lord says, tell them to stop abusing the children. There's somebody here that's abusing the children. After church, the next day, the pastor called me in the morning and said that the current sheriff is now under investigation for child molestation, and he's a member of our church. And certain accusations have been brought up against him. What I'm trying to tell you is the Holy Ghost will tell you stuff that doesn't even make sense. But when you know that something is fake, ah, oh, Jesus. Y'all promise y'all won't get mad at me. <laughs> there is so much of this stuff going on in the, in the church until I'm, ah, oh, you just get tired. Dem and I went to a meeting. I'm not going to call the guy's name out. Some of you have heard it before. Because you'll say I'm putting people on blast, and I most certainly am this morning, because I'm not going to call the name. But, <laughs> but you need to know. They put us right there where Rob and Adrian we're sitting. I'm not going to call this guy's name, high-profile guy and whatnot. And Deborah remembers. And, <laughs> and he came by and he was doing his thing. Hands on, fall down. Hands on, fall down. Everybody was falling down. He came to mess with my Hands on, I'm still standing. Hands on again, I'm still standing. Hands on again, I'm still standing. He said, well, I better go to the next one. <laughs> all right. Now, and so after all of this is over with, um, Pastor Deborah, she just laid on the floor, you know. And... <laughs> And so she tried to get back up, and she can't. She got up, and he did it to her again. Payal! She went back down again. I'm just sitting in the seat going. <laughs> but this is the part that was not so funny. There was a young couple there, and she was pregnant, and she was showing, and they were in great pain because the child in her womb didn't have a brain. But this man laid hands on this woman. And said, God is going to heal you. Can you imagine that little glimmer of hope? But what happens when the person is a charlatan and a fake and it doesn't happen? Sometimes I believe that God is going to have a special place in hell for people that played on people's emotions just so they could get money and put money in their pockets. And so I said that to say this, just because a person says Jesus and they go through all, that doesn't mean that God is with them. Now, but let me give you a scripture because y'all don't really believe me. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. Let me tell y'all something about me. You say whatever you want to, but I'm going to be real with this. There was a time when I, when I was young and I was foolish. I'm going to be real with this. What God did is he gave me grace to live through my foolishness. And, 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 and he just changed my heart about some things. I may fake about a whole lot of stuff, but this and what in the tears you see me crying, man, that's real. Every time you see me, I'm going to be real. I'm going to be so real. Don't you ask me how I feel if you don't want to know what I'm going to say. Because <laughs> if you ask me if your dress is ugly, and I think it's ugly, I love you, sister, but your dress is kind of, it's kind of lacking just a little bit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter, don't ask me if your baby's cute. 
If you hear me say, that's interesting. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 3. Y'all, I'm probably making somebody mad. Y'all stop laughing. All right, now look at this. But I fear, lest by any means, watch this, as the serpent has beguiled Eve through his subtility. I actually believe that some people are under a spirit of bewitchment because I'm trying to figure out how can you sit and listen to this and be a Christian and read your Bible and not say, wait a minute, Pat, that, that kind of doesn't make it. But you just sit there and take it. The Bible says that some Christians like to be lied to. They like to be manipulated. They like to be used. But the Bible says, by fearless, by any means, in a certain God Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. We don't have to jump through all the hoops we're jumping through to try to reach Jesus. All of this crazy stuff that we're doing, trying to reach Jesus. Jesus knows where you are, and he knows what you're dealing with. And you don't even have to go to church to get him to respond. I dare you to cry out to God in your home. I dare you to lift your hand and just, God, help me. You don't have to wait till Sunday to get to the altar. The God that I serve, listen, he will trespass, and he will come into your house, and he will come into your situation, and he can deliver you without one drop of oil. And without one Shonda Shonda, see my Honda, God can deliver you without all of that. <laughs> he found me in a shower one morning, crying in the shower the night before I had drank a whole bottle of Tangeray by myself. But I knew I was in trouble. And I knew I couldn't tell anybody what I was going through. And so while I was there in the morning, getting ready to take my twins to the daycare, I put my hands up in my shower and I said, God, I need you to help me. Have you ever been there yeah. where you had to say, God, I need you to help me? Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that I cried to the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, and that's why I serve him. <laughs> Let's keep going. For as much, for such are false. If there's a truth, there has to be a false. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. What is a deceitful worker? A deceitful worker is like a person that gets invited to a church. And what that person does is they go on social media and they find the church website. And they look at the people that are top fans and the people that have contributed and that are there all the time. And, that are, and they get all that information. And then when they walk into the church, they'll say, I'm, I'm hearing a name. I'm, I'm hearing a name, and, and this person, he, he has a limousine business. Yeah, you're doing something with, with cars, and, 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 and your name is, is, is uh, you, you, you got an odd name, Salvacutus. That's not a normal name, so it must be God. No, it's not God, it's the iPad. <laughs> but for those of you, the uninitiated, that are sitting there, and all you want is God, it looks like God to you. When Deborah and I was, were first, when we first, I mean really, really were saved and dedicated our life to the Lord, I was hot after God. I used to fast every week. I was, when I went to work in the morning, the first thing I did after I got my coffee, because I worked in a place by myself, is I opened my Bible, I began to study and hear tapes all day long. That's what I did. And we heard about a man who was coming to Orlando for a tent meeting. He was a well-known, he, he was at the top of his, his game back in those days. And we drove all the way from Patrick, and we drove over here, and we saw this man. Your doctor's name is Dr. So-and-so-and-so, -and, -so -and, -so, and he's treating you for this, that, and the other. I came to tell you that the Lord is going to heal you. And we were so happy and so, oh, praise God. Have you ever been there where you're just naive in the things of the Spirit and everything? You just praise God. And so we left. We went back to Patrick. I worked at the base. I came back the next day. And when I came back the next day, I noticed something odd. There was a guy in a wheelchair that had a wheelchair that was there the night before he was sitting in the back. And I ain't paying any attention. I'm just, just young and, and excited for God. About a month later, ABC did a dossier on this same preacher. And uh, come to find out, he had a little bit of earpiece in his ear, and he had people that greeted people at the door and took certain information at the door. And they knew where people were sitting in the congregation, and so he kind of knew where to go. 
And um, ABC just, just uncovered everything. And, just put, and he went to jail. He, went to jail. he lost the church. As a matter of fact, Bishop Jakes bought his old church, the Eagle's Nest, and that's how he got started out in Dallas. But for Deborah and I, can you imagine being young in the faith? You've never heard about miracles. You come from a Baptist background, and now you hear about miracles. And God, I want to see miracles. I want you to work through me. And all of a sudden, you see this on the news. Let me tell you something. And you carry, if you carry nothing away, today you carry this away. Do not put your trust in a pastor, a preacher, evangelist, a healing guy. Do not put your trust in any of them. You put your trust in the Lord. And can I tell you something? I don't care if you're in the river right now. I have no problem saying what I'm saying. If you feel like there's something wrong and something is not right, get up. Do the one finger t- do the one finger raise. Do the one finger raise. Y'all know how we do it. And just tip on out the back door. Now you want to leave now anybody. If you think something, get up, go. Now you're scared to go. <laughs> All right. Let, let's go back to what we were reading. Look at this. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Continue. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transformed, are transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. One of the reasons I'm going to have to get off social media is because I just say what's on my mind. I saw this guy from Africa with a long cape on. It's a couple of them right now. And uh, they, they, y'all don't know it. It's divination and witchcraft. And they walk up and, and just throw their foot like this and everybody falls down, you know. And they do all kinds of gyration like, like you got a superpower in your hand. Just throw it like that. And everybody falls down. What kind of mess in the... <laughs> and, 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 and here it is. Their churches are not full of older saints. Their churches are filled with younger saints. Because the older saints <laughs> that have walked with God for a while, been there, seen that, got the hat. I'll just go ahead and stay in my own little church. Y'all go ahead in your capes and your designer clothes and kick and knock people down. I'm just going to stay with Jesus. You'll be singing that, give me that old-time religion. Y'all keep that new stuff. Okay. Now, what I'm trying to say is the anointing of God will show you what's real and what's fake and what to get away from and what to avoid. And you don't have to be in church to encounter a devil. You remember we had that Camaro? We bought that brand-new red Camaro, that Z28 with those T-tops? And she was driving home one day and drove through some white paint that people had in the road. And white paint was all on the side of my brand new red car with the T-tops, the Camaro Z28 with the wide tires on it. <laughs> and I'm supposed to act like it doesn't affect me when she said, t- I, I drove through the car, some paint on the car. Go get it off then. But anyway, um, I had to go down to a hardware store to get this special kind of paint remover. I was at Patrick Air Force Base then to take the paint off the car. And I went into a hardware store. I've seen it, I had never gone in before. And I was, got my thing and I brought it to the counter. And the guy had on a, a mason's ring. That was the first thing I noticed. But then he began to read me at the counter. You know what I mean when I say read me? He began to tell me stuff he had no business knowing. Now, it could have easily sounded like God but it didn't feel like God. I didn't say this, but in my mind, I'm like, man, take my money, give me my stuff, and I'm out. And I left. The devil can do some stuff that looks like it's God and will have you all caught up and twisted if you're not careful. And so you, ha- you need to have an... Uh, that, see, the anointing is like... It's like an alarm that goes off. Now, it's not you're going to be yelling and screaming. It's a little something that, that just doesn't, doesn't feel right. It's like when you're talking to somebody and you know they're lying, but you just smile. <laughs> In the back of your mind, you're saying, continue. <laughs> you see, so this is why we need to have a relationship 
not just to come once a Sunday, but you need to have a relationship with the Holy Ghost where I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying, I'm studying, and I'm fasting on my own without being directed by my local church because in my relationship with God, I want to know everything I can possibly know about God because if he's my father, I want to know him. And my father has already let me know that even though I'm a Christian, there's some wicked folk in our ranks. It's not my notes, but get, is it 2 Chronicles chapter 7? We're going to get into the good stuff. It, where it says, uh, if my people that are called by my name, what's that? 2 Chronicles 7 and? In the back, can y'all give me 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and 14? I want, I want to show you something. Amen. If my people, whose people? He never said the devil's people. He said, these are my people. He said, if my people who are called by will humble themselves, which tells us we have a problem with pride, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He is not talking to people that he does not know. He's saying that I have some people that have wicked ways. So if you're coming to the Lord and you're just getting saved, don't be surprised when you see people that sit beside you, that sing like you, that pray like you, that have some wicked ways. They'll ask you for money because they're in a tight, and out of the goodness of your heart, you lend them the money. And then when you try to get the money back, they've left church. They're going to Reverend Pharaoh's church. Wicked ways. Y'all laughing. I had a pastor do that to me. Gave him over fifteen dollars to $20,000. Said he's going he to give back to me. I waited. And I waited, and I waited, and when I was going to act up, Pastor Deborah said, don't do that. Said he might be going through a rough time, and I waited, and the next thing I know, he moved his church to Miami. Now I'm ready to catch Brightline. <laughs> Amen, I'm ready to go right on down there, just bust up in there one Sunday morning. Amen. So, so here's the thing about Christians. It is important that we know the ways of God more so than we know the acts of God because the acts of God can be counterfeited, but the ways of God cannot be counterfeited. Let me show you something. Look at Psalms chapter 103 and verse number 7. The Word of God says this, He made known His ways to Moses and His acts to the children of Israel. I'm not concerned about the acts of God. I've seen them and I appreciate them when they show up in my life, but I'm not following my acts. His acts, I'm following him because I know that acts can be replicated. Acts can be duplicated. Now, what does all of this have to do with the anointing? It's the anointing that seals you. Do you know the Bible says that we're sealed? Amen. Now, some of you, that, that's, not, that's a foreign concept the concept of being sealed. But can I give you a word picture? Just allow me, and we're going to get into this because there's a lot to this, and I'm going to have to come back and talk to you about it later. Um, if you, how many of you during the summer, as a child growing up, one of the worst things that you could have ever seen was a bucket of peas? <laughs> See, city folk, y'all don't know about that, but during the summer, people would pick peas and bring them out of the bushes, and everybody had to sit on You couldn't play marbles. You couldn't do nothing. You had to help chuck peas. Like, this is the joy of my summer existence, all right? Then after the peas were shucked, they were parboiled, and after they were parboiled, they were placed inside a container that was called a mason jar. How many of you know what mason jars are? And after the food was placed in the mason jar, the top was put on the thing, and it was hermetically sealed. Then they would take it to a storeroom or a cabinet, and they would put it there. And even years later, if they wanted to have peas in winter when it was out of season, they could go to the cabinet and put it off the shelf. Shoot, y'all never had no tomatoes in okra. <laughs> some of y'all don't have no idea what I'm talking about. But man, they would stew those tomatoes in okra and, and put it over some rice? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> But because what was placed in the container was sealed, it was kept. Because it was sealed, it was kept. And that's why I tell you, God knows how to keep you when you can't keep yourself. Because when you called on the name of Jesus and the Holy Ghost came into your life, shoo, you were sealed until the day of redemption. And this is the good news. And this is why I close every Sunday with this. Now unto him 
who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with it. I'm kept and I'm sealed. Even when I mess up, I'm kept. And see, that's what the devil doesn't like because he can't get to you now the way that he used to get to you because he's the accuser of the brethren night and day. But he can no longer bring an accusation against you because you've been sealed and you're kept. Now, see, you may not believe it, but when Jesus comes back, you're going to find out I was sealed. And when you're sealed, stuff that tries to get in can't get in no more. How many of you like Red Snapper? I mean a good old red. Let me get a fish that you like. Uh, something that comes out of the ocean. <laughs> that fish is born in salt water. That fish breathes daily in and out salt water. He lives his entire existence as a salty, briny existence. When you catch the fish and you pull him out of the water, if the water falls on your hand and you taste it, it is still salt water. But if you clean that fish and you fillet that fish and you fry that fish and you don't put any seasoning on it at all, you will never taste one bit of salt. Why? Because he was in the environment, but he was sealed so that the environment... And my concern with the church and the question that I'm asking is, have we been sealed? Because how can so many things from the world begin to infiltrate the body of Christ? Do y'all know, and I'm going to move on. I saw a worship service the other day where doing worship, this was online, it wasn't in any church here in Orlando. A guy, apparently he was a member of the church who was a bodybuilder. And while they were doing praise and worship, he came up on the stage in his tank top. And, and you know, he was. <laughs> you know, he, he's flexing on the stage and showing his muscles. I'm like, what does this have to do with Jesus? But I wasn't mad at him. I wanted to find out who's the pastor. Man, what are you doing? Who, who told you that this is, oh, Jesus, that's why I got to stay off the thing. Okay, now, I told you I don't have a time. Okay. <laughs> Um, let's close with this and then we'll pick it up the next time we talk about this I want to tell you what the anointing is um, do you know that you can be anointed to do something that doesn't really have anything to do with the church when you look at the Old Testament and you read about the building of the temple God told Moses to go and get certain people in certain families because he said, I've anointed them to be artificers, or I have anointed them to be workers of gold and silver. You see, some people are just gifted to do certain things. Yes, now, well, let me use that word. They are anointed because there's a difference between a gift and an anointing, you see. Uh, <laughs> there's a man. Stay with church, Marvin. Don't get in politics. There was a king whose name was Cyrus, a Persian king. And at that time, the Persians ruled over the Jews, and the Jews were subject to their authority, their rule, and reign. And God told Nehemiah that he had anointed Cyrus to let them go so that they could go back to Israel, or Jerusalem, that had been destroyed during the exile, and rebuild the walls. Cyrus's sole purpose was to facilitate the rebuilding of the temple and the wall, that's all he was anointed to do because he was the king at that particular time. Yes, sir. I want to say something so bad, but I can't. No, I ain't going to say this because some of y'all get mad at me. Uh, and so, no, when, uh, when, when Nehemiah went to Cyrus, one day he was the cupbearer. He was Nehemiah's cupbearer. Do you know what a cupbearer is? Yeah. Have you ever thought about the type of person that you would have to be for the king to choose you to be the cupbearer? Because the cupbearer, whenever the king's food came, the cupbearer was like Pastor Deborah. The cupbearer was a taster. How many of y'all are married to tasters? You know, they're going to order their food, but when your food comes out, let me taste it. <laughs> now, you could have ordered anything you wanted. The whole menu was yours. You didn't order this. Eat what you have. You can, don't you put your fork over here in my plate. Lord, I says it's better to give than receive. Not about my food, no. <laughs> okay, I got off. Where's about the taster? Okay, so the king had to trust this man implicitly 
Because if the taster was a part of any conspiracy, he could act like the food was okay and the king could get poisoned and die. And so he was a taster and he, and he went in and, uh, and he was before the king and the king said, why are you sad? He said, how can I be happy when I've heard about the condition of my home and the temple and the city ruins? He said, I can't be happy. He said, tell me what you need. How many of y'all work a job like that? Hallelujah. Where you can go in before your boss one day with your head hung down. You say, hey, man, what's wrong with you? Tell me what you need. Tell me how much more you want in your paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but when he told him what he needed, guess what he said? He said, go and I'll have the guys cut down all the timber that you need so that you have all the timber that you need. And because I know that the roadway is perilous and there are, listen, uh, 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 burglars and whatnot along the road, I'm going to give you a military escort to escort you. Now, this is a cupbearer. This is a person of low estate. And he said, tell me how long you want to be gone. How many of you can go into HR right now and say, listen, you know, I, I ain't feeling it. I'm going to take the rest of the year off. And, and what I'm going to do... <laughs> Uh, I'd like to also keep all my benefits and all my pay. And if any raises take place over the months while I was gone, please go ahead and make them backtracking so I can incur and, and get everything. Uh, try it! <laughs> and come back and tell me how that works out. But why? Cyrus was anointed to facilitate that one particular thing. Do you know that God can anoint a person to cook? Okay. <laughs> there are some people in this church that can cook. I call this stuff like crack cakes because I don't care what kind of discipline you have. If you just eat a crumb of that cake and you say, you know what? That's the devil. I'm, I'm not going to bother that no more. <laughs> All right. Shoot. Those cakes so good, they'll wake you up two or three o'clock in the morning and you pretend you have to go down to the refrigerator to get some water and you'll find that cake. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but anyway. All right. Now, here's what the anointing is. We got to go. The anointing is God's presence and God's power. You cannot get God's presence without God's power. And if the Holy Ghost is in you, you have God's presence and you have God's power. Didn't he say you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come? Now, why do I have his presence and why do I have his power? Because I'm supposed to perform something that he created me to perform. So the anointing is God's presence and power to perform his purposes for your life. Amen. Let me say it again. It's God's presence in your life, God's power in your life to perform what he created you to perform. Amen. Okay? Now, your anointing, you have grace for your anointing. You don't have grace for mine. And I don't have grace for yours. And so once you understand that, then you will not be pulled out of your anointing into a place where you should not be. Pastor, what do you mean pulled out of my anointing into a place that should not be? There's a story about a prophet in the Old Testament. God told him to go and declare a word. And he said, when you declare this word, he said, do not leave the way that you came. How many of you all remember that? When you speak this, God says, don't go back the way you came. And another prophet came and told him, well, I'm a, I'm a prophet of the Lord too. And the Lord said, uh, you can come on back to my house and let's eat. And he went back and he ate. And then when he was leaving, going back, I think it was a lion. And uh, was it a donkey? But the lion killed him and he was laying there in the road, you see. Because he got pulled out of his anointing because somebody else said, I'm a prophet just like you. You know, come on, let's fellowship together. And he died. I don't play with the anointing that God has placed on my life. I don't try to be somebody that I'm not. I stand in the simplicity of God's grace upon my life and do what I know I have been called, anointed, and appointed to do, and that is teach the body of Christ the word of God. I am not called to be a, a, um, a, a good preacher, a good exhortational preacher. You know, I, I admire the people that can do it. Ah, yeah. Uh, that's... That, that, that. That's not my thing. I have great respect for you, especially when you're saying something worth, worth hearing. But I found that uh, a good piece of steak makes his own gravy. <laughs> See, y'all don't understand that. If, if, if you're cooking with cube steak, you got to work on that. You got to dress that up and put some... Somebody, what is cube steak? That lets me know you can't cook, all right? Cube steak. 
<laughs> but if you're cooking cube steak, cube steak is not tender. You got to dress that up. And when you get done, you got to take that little grease in the frying pan, put some onions in there, and let those onions brown down, throw a little flour on there, a little bit of water, and stir it until you get a nice root. And then somebody said, Pastor knows how to cook. Yes, I do. And <laughs> And then you put the cube steak back into the gravy because I need to dress that up to make it taste good. But when you've got a good piece of steak, you don't have to put any gravy on it. You don't have to put any onions on it. When you grill it up, it makes its own gravy. And the Word of God does not need my help. The Word of God will stand by its own. The Word of God will make its own gravy. The Word of God will deliver you. The Word of God will save you. The Word of God will heal your marriage. The Word of God will heal your mind. The Word by itself. I don't have to dress it up. I don't have to fix it up. I don't have to perform for you. Just teach the Word of God. Did you get anything out of the Word of God today? Now, I know some people just like to be entertained. That, you know, that, that, that's us. We, we like to be entertained. Two of the greatest players. I'm about to close, and we're going to do communion. Two of the greatest players ever to play the sport of basketball, Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. Y'all young heads don't know about this. This was back when they made real basketball players. <laughs> if you don't know about Kevin McHale and those boys, they played real basketball. The two greatest players doing that were Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. What made Michael Jordan famous? Michael Jordan's tongue used to hang out of his mouth. When he was coming down the court, he stopped, go back and forth, you know, shimmy and shake you, go to the hoop and do a finger roll. And we just, woo! Oh, man, that was bad. Didn't he kill it? Larry Bird, on the other hand, he's going to go over here in the corner, kind of play around over there, and Mikhail's going to throw a pass over there, and this is all he's going to do, and run back down the court. Now, when Michael made his two, we went crazy. When Larry made his two, it's, oh, that's all right, that's all right. But see, what we want is we want to be entertained. You want somebody to show out for you and buck dance and do all the, the word of God by itself. You don't need to dress it up or fix it up. Amen. Father, we thank you. Jesus, keep me on track. God, we thank you for your word. It was here before we showed up, and it will be here when we leave. Jesus said before one jot or tittle failed, he said everything will fall apart. God, as we continue this teaching on your anointing, your presence, and your power in our lives to perform your purposes for our lives, God, I pray that you would roll away the scales from our eyes and the scales from our heart, that we might truly see you and the simplicity of what you're trying to do in your kingdom and in your name. We thank you, O oh God. Hide the word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. And all of God's people said, amen. All righty. Um, if you're here today and uh, you don't know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, or you do know the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, but you've backslidden, you've kind of strayed away, are you looking for a place where you can say, Pastor Marvin, this is my church home? Three things. Number one, I want to be saved. Number two, I'm already saved, but I'm struggling right now in my walk and I want to rededicate my life. Number three, I want to become a part, a partner or a member of this church. If you fall into any of those categories and you want to get up and come up here right now, you can come up here right now and we will receive you now. If that is not your cup of tea and you want to go ahead and do communion because you got some stuff, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stop waiting on your friend to endorse what God told you to do. I'm going to say it again. Stop waiting on your friend to endorse what God told you to do. God has already told you what you should do concerning this matter, but you're waiting on your friend's approval. And you're sitting in here right now. Oh, just a little bit. Because it's going to take courage for you to move. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Thank you all so much. For, is this a family? Oh, man, this is good salvation. When you get the whole house. Hallelujah. All righty. Um, see the young lady over there in the red? 
She's going to take you guys to a private area. She's going to pray with you, assess what your spiritual needs are. And based upon that, she's going to put some materials in your hand. If you are coming to become a part of this ministry, we want to welcome you and your family to the River of Life Christian Center. And listen, I promise you, we're not a perfect church. There's some jacked up people here, all right? <laughs> But here's the thing, we, we try to love one another and do the best that we possibly can and, and just realize there's no perfect families. We have to have grace to deal with people. But if anybody does anything stupid and, and you need to let me know, let me know and I promise you we'll, we'll take care of it. But that's too hard for your first day. So just go ahead and, <laughs> and hallelujah. All right. Amen. Y'all ready for the Lord's communion today? Amen. I got to put together a teaching on the blood and why the blood is so important relative to the Christian faith because there are other faiths that don't place an importance on blood as much as we do in the Christian faith but the Word of God declares that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin and if we were to really trace what we're getting ready to do and the significance of the blood we would have to go back to the Garden of Eden what happened after Adam and Eve sinned did they try to cover their own nakedness? And how did they try to cover their own sin and their own nakedness? With fig leaves. But when God showed up, apparently their attempts to cover their own sin was not adequate. And the Bible says that God took the skin of animals and he made them a garment that covered their nakedness. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but do you know any animals that exist on the planet that you can take their skin away from them and they don't bleed? So therefore... Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And I've told you this time and time again, I'm going to tell you again. It is the order of God. I did not come up with this. I don't know why God does it. But it is the order of God that in order for the guilty to go free, something innocent must die. The animal that died was innocent, had nothing to do with the transgression. When Jesus went to the cross, he was innocent. He hadn't done anything wrong. The Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. He sat with the twelve on the night before he was to be crucified, trying to explain them the spiritual, the spiritual significance of what they were about to do. And on that night, he took a simple piece of bread, he blessed it, and then he broke that bread, that bread signifying that his body would soon be broken. And he commanded them to eat. Let us do likewise. How many of y'all remember that song? Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. And then on that same night, he poured a cup and he lifted it up in front of them. He said, this is the blood of the New Testament. And it's shed for many for the remission of sins. In other words, even after more than 2,000 years, the blood of Jesus is still working as much as it was working when it was shed on Calvary's cross. He blessed the cup, commanded them to drink. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. Come on, one more time. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. I got a new version that I don't know. I don't know that version. I know the old version. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us at the River of Life Christian Center. I pray and I know that God's grace is going to keep you until we meet again. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding glory. To you, O oh God, we give the glory, the honor, and the praise. And all of God's children said in a loud, happy, and hilarious voice. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.